In this video, I'm going to talk with you about Nineveh in modern day, or a representation of Nineveh in modern day. We're going to read from Jonah, starting in the third chapter, 2 Chronicles 7, Exodus 15, and Ezekiel 24. Jonah 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give to you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Okay, the reason we're not reading the first couple chapters is because that's when Jonah didn't obey the Lord, but that's not what this video is about. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed in God. A fast was proclaimed. And all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of, of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not, not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may relent, may yet relent, and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. The difference between this Nineveh and us today is that Nineveh believed in God, and they knew what to do, and they listened at that time. And Jesus even says that, at the judgment that the men of Nineveh will stand up at, with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and now something greater than Jonah is here. So he was saying, you guys don't even believe. This generation doesn't even believe. They who were going to be destroyed are going to stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it for they repented at the preaching of Jonah because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. And you remember that the word says that in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he requires everyone everywhere to repent because he sent his son, and no one perceives it. No one gets it. There is prophecy about a future Nineveh through Nahum and Zephaniah regarding Nineveh's destruction. But at that time, they knew what to do because they believed in God. And if you believe in God, you know what he requires, and you return to what he requires. A storm surge is expected to be at least twice as high in Florida as it was in Asheville, which just was just decimated, by the way. And also, I don't know if you know this, but Asheville was actually touted to be a climate haven for those who had sort of climate consciousness, whatever this is. And yet it's been decimated. And, and I don't think that that is coincidental at all. I think that was intentional because scientists were declaring Asheville to be a climate haven. But God gets the final word and he foils the knowledge of the wise. So while everyone's talking about climate consciousness and, and climate change and what needs to happen and that this is our government's fault and some even claiming that the government controls the weather, okay? because the government is God, right? And ironically, the ones who are saying that are usually those claiming to be Christian. Do you see that when the warning was given to Nineveh, they knew what they needed to do? The warning has been given to you. The warning has been given to you by God's prophets, by his witnesses. I've been talking about it. The warning has been given to you even by scientists. They've been saying Whatever we do in the next so many years isn't really going to do anything right now. It's not going to change anything right now, but it may change things for our children in the future like 50 years from now. I'm telling you that Jesus is coming back before 50 years to collect his bride and that God foils the knowledge of the wise. I want to remind you of some things. As you're looking around at the destruction and you're seeing what the world is calling climate change and you're listening to scientists tell you what you need to do in order to avoid climate change, which is stupid because this is God's judgment and you're not going to avoid God's judgment by putting up solar panels on your house. I want to remind you of what God covenanted with his people in his word. Exodus 15, 26, 
if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Remember that when you hear about the next surge of COVID or you hear about the next plague that God sends. Second Chronicles chapter 7. When I shut up the heavens so that there's no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, oh, okay, Nineveh understood this, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. How can you say that you believe if you don't, if these aren't the things that you do? This is not your response. Like you don't recognize the times so that you know what God's people are supposed to be doing. How can you say you believe when you don't do what Isaiah said? Go, my people, close your doors, hide yourselves for a little while until his wrath has passed by. How can you say you're his people if that doesn't jog your memory to Passover when he says, go in to your dwellings, rid your houses of yeast, rid your house of sin, and by the blood of the lamb, you're going to be passed over. How can you say you believe if these are not the things that you do, if this is not what's jogged in your memory regarding God's covenant with you? While you're waiting for Milton, while you're waiting to see what happens with this, I want you to remember that over a week ago, I told you that God spoke to me that he's going to overflow your hiding place. He's going to expose you. And I said, don't lean on your understanding because God will expose your heart based on the things that he puts you through or the things he raises or in you or the things that he confronts you with. He's going to expose your heart by the way that you respond to that. He is going to overflow your hiding place. I want you to remember that I've said that the one thing that you are not dealing with is going to be the thing that takes you out. And this morning he spoke to me and actually enacted the shock and horror that is going to come down on the inhabitants of the earth. Not just Asheville, not just Florida, Asheville, Florida, Palestine. These are signs to you guys. These are signs to you guys of what is going to happen to you. You should be able to recognize that. He's reminding me right now that Isaiah 20 is another, is another pa- uh, chapter that he's been raising in me lately in which Isaiah is going around as a sign stripped and barefoot. And God says, just as my servant Isaiah has gone stripped and barefoot for three years as a sign and portent against Egypt and Cush, so the king of Assyria will lead away stripped and barefoot the Egyptian captives and Cushite exiles, young and old with buttocks bared, To Egypt's shame. Those who trusted in Cush and boasted in Egypt will be dismayed and put to shame. And in that day, the people who live on the coast, on this coast, will say, See what has happened to those we relied on, on to those we fled to for help and deliverance from the king of Assyria? How then can we escape? God's people don't even recognize the signs. You're not even looking at these things and thinking because you're so brainwashed by the world that this is global warming. If what would happen if you looked at these things and you said, God is upset. Oh my goodness. He's hitting Bible belt. Goodness. He's hitting Bible belt first. Imagine that. Why would God bring these things on his people? Those claiming to be his people. Why would he do that first on them? Because he's exposing which ones are his and which ones are not by the way that they respond. And you should be looking at that and saying, I know the difference between a narrative made up by the world, such as global warming or climate change, and the truth of what is written in God's word. I know my covenant, and I know that, when God, that God is the one that sends these things, and that when God sends these things, that he's calling his people in. And based on the way that they respond, then we can know who are his and who are not. I know what's going on right now. I told you several weeks back that he was going to bring sword, famine, wild beast, and plague. And I feel him beginning to bring this judgment. I feel him talking with me about it. He first spoke with me about that. Then he talked about overflowing your hiding place. And now he's speaking with me about other things. And he's speaking with me about the reaction that people are going to feel. The shock and horror that is going to come down on the inhabitants of the earth. Let me tell you why. Ezekiel 24. In the ninth year, in the tenth month, on the tenth day, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, record this date, this very date, because the king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem. 
this very day. Tell this rebellious people a parable and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Put on the cooking pot, put it on and pour water into it, put into it the meat pieces of meat, all the choice pieces, the leg and the shoulder, fill it with the best of these bones. Take the pick of the flock, pile wood beneath it for the bones, bring it to a boil and cook the bones in it. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to the city of bloodshed, to the pot now encrusted, whose deposit will not go away. Take the meat out piece by piece in whatever order it comes. For the blood she shed is in her midst. She poured it on the bare rock. She did not pour it on the ground where the dust would cover it. To stir up wrath and take revenge, I put her blood on the bare rock so that it would not be covered. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to the city of bloodshed. I too will pile the wood high. So heap on the wood and kindle the fire. Cook the meat well, mixing in the spices and let the bones be charred. Then set the empty pot on the coals till it becomes hot and its copper glows so that its impurities may be melted and its deposits burned away. It has frustrated all efforts. Its heavy deposit has not been removed, not even by fire. Now your impurity is lewdness. Because I tried to cleanse you, but you would not be cleansed from your impurity, you will not be clean again until my wrath against you has subsided. I, the Lord, have spoken. The time has come for me to act. I will not hold back. I will not have pity, nor will I relent. You will be judged according to your conduct and your actions, declares the sovereign Lord. I've read this to you guys so many times, so many times. And I believe the reason why God has had me read it to you is because he wants to give you time to return to him. And I I know that no one has returned to him because if they had, they would have been moved by him to start coming to assembly, to assemble with God's people all the more as the day approaches. You would be moved and you have not been moved. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, with one blow. I am about to take away from you the delight of your eyes. Yet do not lament or weep or shed any tears. Groan quietly. Do not mourn for the dead. Keep your turban fastened and your sandals on your feet. Do not cover your mustache and beard or eat the customary food of mourners. So I spoke to the people in the morning and in the evening my wife died. The next morning I did as I had been commanded. Then the people asked me, won't you tell us what these things have to do with us? Why are you acting like this? So I said to them, the word of the Lord came to me, son of, say to the people of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I'm about to desecrate my sanctuary, the stronghold in which you take pride, the delight of your eyes, the object of your affection. The sons and daughters you left behind will fall by the sword and you will do as I have done. You will not cover your mustache and beard or eat the customary food of mourners. You will keep your turbans on your heads and your sandals on your feet. You will not mourn or weep, but will waste away because of your sins and groan among yourselves. Ezekiel will be assigned to you. You will do just as he has done. When this happens, you will know that I am the sovereign Lord. And you, son of man, on the day I take away their stronghold, their joy and glory, the delight of their eyes, their heart's desire and their sons and daughters as well. On that day, a fugitive will come to tell you the news. At that time, your mouth will be opened. You will speak with him and will no longer be silent. You will be assigned to them. And they will know that I am the Lord. God brought a situation this morning and then he spoke with me about Ezekiel, about this very passage where Ezekiel is a sign to the people. And he used this situation in order to show me what is going to take place. He placed me in a situation where I was completely horrified and the devastation of that situation brought everything into question. And for a moment, I felt that I could not go on with what he has me doing anymore. I, I, I was absolutely shaken. But see, then your heart is revealed in whether or not you're going to believe anyway. And I'm not going to talk about the situation because it's very personal to me and I don't feel like he's making me talk about it. What I do believe that he wants me to tell you is what I felt in the situation. That the horror of seeing what was going on caused me to question whether he's faithful or not. Whether all of this is real or not. And then he started talking with me about why it is that he needed to put me in that position so that I could feel the feelings that you are going to feel. When he brings what he's going to bring, you are going to feel horror, terror, because everything in your heart is going to be exposed. And you're either going to make a decision to deal with those things in your heart, to become pure gold in which those impurities are separated from your heart or you're not. And if you don't, you will not make it. This is it, guys. This is it. And so you hear in Ezekiel 24, 
that he is saying, you've left me with no other choice. I tried to cleanse you, but you would not be cleansed. I have been talking for three years on this channel, telling you about the times, making myself available to you, telling you about judgment that he has brought, telling you about judgment that he will bring. No one cares. I get it. No one cares. You know why I get it? Because God has already spoken through Ezekiel about what it is to be a watchman at, the, at this end of time. In speaking about those four living creatures, he's letting us know the times of which he is talking about, the times of which Ezekiel was used as a sign, as a watchman to the witnesses. And he specifically tells Ezekiel when he's telling him about what it is he requires of him as a watchman, that you are to say the words, I speak to you, whether they listen or they fail to listen. You have to do this. And it is, it is your covenant. And if you do it, then you'll be saved. And if you don't, their blood will be on your head. And he says another thing that's very important. He says, whether they listen or they fail to listen, and they will not listen to you because they do not listen to me. He says, I'm sending you to the people of Israel. You guys are supposed to be the people of Israel. Israel is not some made up place in the Middle East that was established in 1948. Israel are God's people. You're supposed to be able to understand the message that I'm speaking because I am speaking on his authority, on his word, by his spirit. The message that I bring to you is coming from him. And you might say, no, he's, well, he's given me the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and you haven't been listening to him. You hear what the word says? When he sends his prophets, it's because you haven't been listening to him. That is the reason he sends his witnesses. The prophets have never spared anybody's feelings. It's really not about your feelings. It's about do you love truth or not? Do you want to be saved or not? Are you willing to do the things that you need to do in order to be in this covenant and be in his kingdom? Because if you're not, you only deceive yourselves by calling yourself Christian. You will see the judgment. You're going to see what he's going to bring because this is going to affect everyone. Discern the message with God.